Let's welcome our friend, retired Chief Tom Weitzel uh, from Riverside, back to Double Dallas, kind of our go-to guy for all things law enforcement. Chief, how are you? And what's your favorite Jimmy Buffett song? Yeah, my favorite song is Cheeseburger in Paradise. I, I, I remember I went to see him live in concert, and that version that he played was outstanding. Yeah. Where'd you see him? What venue? I saw him at what used to be the, the Toyota Center, I believe in Bridgeview. Yeah, Bridgeview, sure. Yeah. You know he's worth a billion dollars? Not bad for just songs about sand and women and booze. <laughs> I read that. I read his net worth, yes. <laughs> a bi- nice nice <laughs> round number. A billion. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to talk about two things here. I saw your most recent article, which you put up at Twitter and Facebook and all the other social media platforms. I think it's excellent. We've talked in the past about when you interact with police, how to interact safely and politely. I don't want to go through all that again. Put your hands up on the wheel. Turn on the interior lights. Be polite. Yes, no. Don't argue. And uh, once the police officer decides what's going to happen, just go along with it. You'll have recourse in the future. But I thought that this other, this most recent article, taking steps to improve relations with police, not necessarily on the street, but helping them do their job. It's a two-way street. As you wrote, I'm sure that you've read countless stories, articles, and even some polls on how the police can better respond to community members and what the community expects from police. Okay, this column is, is going to focus on ways that residents and their engagement with the police can help the police in their daily functions. In other words, it's a two-way street. Good manners cost nothing. I guess the overall lesson, Chief, of this article is to get involved, yes? No, oh, absolutely. I mean... Um, just a few of the points. I won't go over them all, but volunteers is, is certainly would be at the top. And I, I would mean that residents can actually volunteer on committees and commissions that make a difference. When I was chief, we had a public safety committee. We had a budget committee. We had a, a committee that looked at equipment we would buy. And And the reason that is a good idea is village board and village managers, city managers, when I would go in front of them for budget time and ask for something that the board maybe wasn't so hot on or didn't think we needed, if residents supported it and they came and spoke at the board meeting, we almost always got it approved in our budget. What does it mean here, one of the 10 you wrote about, join the academy? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I was talking about the Citizens Police Academy, and nowadays they even have the uh, Junior Citizens Police Academies. And, you know, those are, they've been a concept for 20, 25 years, but those are actually very good and most police agencies allow the participants to actually ride in the squad cars, both on night shifts, day shifts. They allow them. It, sometimes if you have a range, they will take you down to the range or at least the shoot, don't shoot part where you're using the mm. video concept. Wow. So, I mean, those are really good ways to learn about how you operate as an agency. I did that once. I failed miserably. <laughs> nice. It's harder than most people yeah, think. It's, 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 yeah, watching shoot. cop shows doesn't help. Right. Uh, one other one on, on the list. Explain how you think we should get our kids involved with the police earlier, the better. Yeah. So, I mean, I, there was countless times that I was when I was chief, I was thinking to myself, how could I write this article, this story about there's plenty of that, how the police can help the community, but how can the community help us that they would threaten their kids or tell them the police are going to come get you. I had a parent come into the lobby and ask that we put their child into our lockup cell mm. so that we could teach them a lesson. I mean, that, that was an actual happened. And I, I was a sergeant then, and I'm like, no, we're not going to put your <laughs> five-year-old in the lockup. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, that's not a really good way to interact with us. But um, it means positive contacts. Um, so, you know, station tours, let them see the squad cars, not locking them up in the cell yeah. um, to teach them a lesson. Want to get your take, and this is retired Chief Tom Weitzel. He spent 17 years as chief on Riverside, almost 40 years in the business. Um, members of the Community Commission for Public Safety here in Chicago uh, blasted a recent arbitrator's, arbiters, arbiters ruling that if approved by the city council would allow for rank-and-file police officers accused of serious misconduct to have their disciplinary cases decided behind closed doors. Because of the special nature of of being involved in law enforcement, do you see this as acceptable? I do, as long as the outcome is made public. So I, I do believe, you know, arbitrators typically, in my experience with arbitration, they like to split the baby in half. They usually like to please both sides. But I think that this is a, a arbitrator's ruling 
that many just regular citizens believe that police officers don't have the same rights as every other American citizen, and they do. They do have special responsibilities, but under the Constitution, they still have the same legal rights and um, you know rights of procedures that everyone else does. But I, I would just encourage that whatever the outcome is, I don't it, whether they're terminated, suspended, or they're exonerated, those findings should be made public. But not necessarily, well, I guess their names would have to be, not necessarily their home addresses, right? No, I would not be. Uh, I, I, you know, I had an experience with that home address stuff that went crazy when I was still chief when, during the riots in 2020 and the um, protesting when organizations were getting the SWAT officers and the, our, our mobile field fort officers' addresses and posting them on social media, um, their exact address. And yeah. posting them on social media. And that's, you know, that was a dangerous situation, more so for the officer's family than it was uh, the officer himself or herself. But, um, and there were cases where people would come by their homes and just didn't physically injure the officer or the family, mm. but they did do some damage. Just harassment. To their home. You know, the thing is, too, yeah. I, I, w- I wouldn't want to leave my house if I was a law enforcement officer. I knew that it was out there published while I've been accused, rightly or wrongly, of some some uh, serious misconduct. Right. I, I don't, you know, those cases are, you know, in, in a lot of those cases, the officers are exonerated. Um, so, yeah. you know, I, I think that it's not bad to do that. Um, and, when, you know, when they say behind closed doors, they make it seem like secret. There's still going to be a panel there. There's still going to be public members there. There's still going to be an adjudicator. If it's not a judge, it's an administrative hearing officer. that's going to hear those cases. What percentage of complaints do you think are bogus, frivolous, false? Uh, literally, there's probably about half of them are. Oh, I would think higher than that, but yeah, I was gonna, I was and gonna say eighty. Because yeah, people file these complaints not knowing the law or not knowing the police procedure. Like they they say that they saw this incident happen on the street or something, and they think the officer asked. Uh, acting legally or out of scope of authority, and then they just file the complaint. And with being able to file the complaints online, you can just, you know, you can just go home, type it yeah, in, send yeah, it in, yeah. and the agency has to respond. Right, right. Just comes up to works. Are you writing a memoir? <laughs> I'm not. You're not? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I'm, t- I'm telling you my next, I could tell you my next, I don't know if you've noticed it to your listeners, but have you noticed the explosion in police pursuits lately? Oh, Especially yes. Like I, saw, I saw you post that one with the state police the other day, man. It looks like they were going by at 80, 90 miles an hour. Yeah, so I'm going to just kind of do a deep dive into when police should pursue and not pursue. I'm talking about vehicle pursuits. and Because, you know, it's one of those where if you're wrong, you, you probably lose mm-hmm. your job. Mm-hmm. And, if you're, and if you let it go, you're being criticized for letting right. an offender go and committing, continue to commit violent crimes. Did we ever find out what they were doing? The Illinois police, it seemed like five or six cruisers went by. I never heard uh, the resolution of that. Yeah, they, that was a carjacking, and they cleared, the Illinois State Police made that uh, arrest, and they cleared like five to six carjackings in the city. Good. So that one ended well. Good. I'm all for it. I, I, I think they'll, those have to remain uh, properly administered, but I think that that has to be a tool in the toolbox for police to chase. Uh, Chief Tom Weitzel, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate a follow uh, on Twitter at Chief Weitzel, and I look forward to reading your next piece, and I'd at least put those out uh, in a book form, all, all your columns at some point. All right, well, great idea. I appreciate the thought. Thanks, Chief. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks.